Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, May 25th, and this is the weekly market update. So, want to get into the rant here. This one's going to piss off a lot of people, but uh, I've eventually I've decided to get into this. Um, something that I think that could be the biggest contrarian uh, investing setup or thing that's going to have event that's going to happen uh, over the next uh, several decades and that is the fact that uh, it is my view uh, that the earth is actually going to cool and is not going into this uh, 12 years and we're going to be destroyed by heat uh, like as I like to say a lot in my Twitter feed not by fire but by ice so real briefly there's this view around the world, especially among the people in the West. I will point out this is not shared by Russian and Chinese scientists, but uh, specifically the West, the United States and Western Europe. This view that uh, human beings and their activities are causing global warming, or, that, or now it's called climate change. So, as I've stated before in many types of uh, discussions, if you don't define your words properly, that means you don't know what you're talking about. I will go on the record right now. Climate change happens. That's a historical, geological fact. It's been proven. The thing that we're arguing here, or I'm arguing, is that do humans cause the climate to change? Now, I don't take my uh, views lightly. I've been studying this for many years. I'm not a scientist. I'm not biased. I'm not looking for confirmation bias and going out and looking for data that supports my view. But one of the things I always like to look at is politics and who gets involved in things and what's their motives um, and, you know, who benefits, okay? And when I see uh, a fat bum like Al Gore running around, a, a nobody, a know-nothing, a, a, a doorknob uh, that ran for president. It was Bill Clinton's, uh, I guess, riding on Bill Clinton's magic carpet. And then he can turns himself into a centimillionaire by propagating uh, this particular view. That causes alarm for me. You know, I don't take uh, my advice on what's happening with the climate from bartender from the Bronx or a mongoloid, seems to be autistic girl, teenager from Sweden. What I like to do is look at the facts. And the facts are that this, we have in the historical record from several hundred years ago, and going all the way back to the Vikings, we've seen climates change. We've seen the climate change so severely that it has affected crops, it has affected civilizations, it has affected politics and geopolitics. There's a reason why Greenland is called Greenland. You know, back in the, around 1000 or 1100 AD, whatever it was, and Leif Erikson committed a murder and was exiled to Greenland. And he used it as a marketing ploy, calling it Greenland, because he wanted more people to come there and settle. Because at the po that time, there was a, a warming period on the earth, and it was actually green there. They actually raised livestock. Uh, they settled there on the north or the south part of the island. And this is a historical fact. You can look it up. Um, there's an excellent BBC uh, documentary about this. And then uh, after a couple hundred years, uh, we went into another cooling cycle. And a slight change in temperature did not allow those Norse settlements to stay viable. And it's interesting watching the archaeological uh, findings that they, sit, that they uh, went and excavated there about how the Norsemen basically were forced off. And there were times, I've read books about this, and there were times where the sea from Norway and Denmark uh, were iced over and the longboats could not get there from uh, the, home, the homelands to Greenland. And then, you know, there was a period of three or four years, and then when they finally, the ice cleared for a year and people were able to go there, there was nobody left. Everybody was gone. And they didn't know where they went. They asked the local native uh, population, First Nations people, Inuits, where they go, they didn't know. And they just disappeared. So we've seen this before. So when I see things politicized and people say, well, John, there's a consensus. You're not a scientist. 
okay? Galileo, okay, in his time, he was almost put to death for saying that the Earth rotated around the Sun because the scientific consensus at his, in his time was that the Sun revolved around the Earth. And I can go on and on. There was a scientific consensus in the United States that Africans were less human than uh, Westerners. There were scientific consensuses in Nazi Germany that Jews were, you know, subhumans. I mean, just because there's some kind of scientific consensus, which, by the way, is usually from some political standpoint, doesn't mean anything. Science, when the facts change, you have to change your views. Now, don't email me. Don't send me things in the messages. I don't care what you think. I'm putting out an editorial here. And I don't care what anybody else thinks about it. I'm, I, I, I've had this, I've, I've, I've convinced, I'm convinced, okay? Because the earth is actually cooling and has been cooling during this whole charade. So what I look at and what got me going on this was a guy named Don Cox who used to be a uh, guy at BMO Capital. And he used to do, he was a historian by trade. And he was talking about sunspot cycles back I mean, this is going back 10 or 15 years ago. And being a historian, he was aware of the Dalton minimum and the Mounder minimum. He talked about these things, you know, the medieval warming periods and the times back in the, four, you know, 13, 14, 15, 1600s when we had varying, you know, climate changes, if you will. And they were significant enough to alter history. And he suggested that there could be a correlation between the sunspot cycles and these changes in temperature on Earth. You know, it's amazing to me that this big yellow fusion reactor that's 93 million miles away isn't even brought into the discussion when you talk about climate change or saving the Earth or whatever they're talking about. And I will tell you why. You know, you can tax carbon, you can raise gasoline prices, you can force people to buy batteries, and you and your friends and cronies can get wealthy doing this by the force of law. But you can't control the sun. So it's not you, it's not CO2, it's the sun. And what we're seeing now is, I believe, a sunspot cycles for the last couple cycles have been declining. That means we're seeing less and less sunspots. We are seeing data from reputable sources, and I will show later in a couple more slides, that the temperatures have been decreasing on Earth since 1995. And yet we are going on listening to uh, hysteria, this mass hysteria. And we've seen mass hysteria before in history. You know, we, we can point these things out. There's books about Charles McKay wrote a book about this, Popular Delusions and Mass Hysterias and these things. And it gives several examples. And we've seen them on a uh, small scale and a large scale. And that's what we're seeing right now. You know, we have a, in my opinion, a secular westernized culture that has rejected God, that has rejected uh, the norms that brought us to the wealth and uh, civilization that we had. And so human beings have a need to believe in something. Okay, unless, you you know, you're sitting around with your, nil, you know, nihilist friend that, uh, you know, these people are not normal, but most people have to believe in something. So if they don't, if they choose to reject the Christian God, which is the Western historical narrative, then they have to fill the void with something. And they've chosen to do that uh, with politics. And that's, you know, subverted them as, you know, Soviet Union collapsed and, 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 and things like that. So now they've shifted to environmentalism because they want to believe in something. They want to believe and in, in, be part of something bigger than themselves. And I think that's what a lot of this is. And then it gets politicized. And then, of course, you know, corruption and cronyism seeps in. And here's what we have. We have this big thing where we have people that are in power with the potential to affect legislation talking about the world's going to end in 12 years. This is ridiculous. So anyways, uh, sunspots are going down. There seems to be a correlation between less sunspot activity and, you know, changes of, you know, things becoming colder on Earth in some areas, wetter in some areas, drier in other areas. Um, and this has, there's several books you can pick up on Amazon and you can read about this. You can read about what happened during the Mounder Minimum in Europe 
and crop losses and the famines and the wars that, you know, in the political things that happened and how things changed. You know, the, you know, the, the, the year without a summer, these type of things. The, the years that the Thames River froze over and they had winter carnivals. I mean, it wasn't a joyous occasion because there were massive crop failures. And we've been fortunate here in the last seven to 10 years on Earth because of the warming, you know, the, the, the last legacy part of the warming, the good crop conditions we have had, that we've had record yields. I mean, we have record amount of people, 80 million new mouths to feed every year, and we've had excellent crop, crop uh, results all around the world. But we're starting to see some anecdotal dev- evidence that that's changing. And what we're seeing is, is that, um, you know, People can't get their crops in because of the wet, cold weather we've had. I mean, I was just in Denver last weekend, and it was, you know, the day before I got there, or last week, I mean, there was like eight inches of snow up there. I mean, I was working up in Illinois, and it's been raining every single day. People, you know, only about 30% of the corn crop is in. If they don't get it in by June 5th, it's over. So, you know, every day after May 15th, you lose 2% yield. So this is... You know, this is anecdotal. This doesn't prove my thesis, but we're starting to, at some point, you know, some evidence starts manifesting, and if it continues to manifest over several crop seasons or over several years or around the world, then we can start noticing a trend. It starts to correlate a little bit. So here's a chart of the sunspot cycle 24, you can see, uh, which we're in now. Uh, these are the previous sunspot cycles. They go in 11 year cycles. You can see. Uh, t- to the left here, this is a number of observed sunspots, and they've been observing sunspots back like to the 1600s, 1500s. This is not uh, something new. They have data. So uh, this is just recent, and you see the number of sunspots continues to decline. Now, the expectation is, is that sunspot cycle 25, which is going to start here very soon, will be lower uh, than the previous cycle, which we're completing now, which is 24. And uh, this is from the Moana Loa Observatory in Hawaii. This isn't, you know, some flake on the internet. This is from a, a legitimate observatory. This, this is what they do. They count the sunspots. Uh, no editorial needed. Uh, the number of sunspots has been declining, declining over time. This is a, a temperature chart uh, which shows, here's zero, And it shows the rate of temperature change per year. Now, this is from the East Anglia uh, Observatory or uh, Department of Climate. Uh, I I don't know what exactly it's called, but I'll put it in the show notes. Um, And what you can see is is that since about 1995, you know, we've we've seen temperatures change per year has peaked in the 90s, mid 90s, and has been in decline ever since. As a matter of fact. We are now, uh, the temperature's actually, you know, been peaked and then declined per year. And this is consistent. This is not, you know, another flake on the internet. This is from the outfit that got caught uh, changing data when it didn't fit the narrative. If you remember the East Anglia um, uh, brouhaha was around 2008. And they were caught with all the emails. Somebody hacked in there and got all the emails. Michael Moore with the hockey stick. And they were, they were doing things like, you know, conspiring against other people that didn't uh, have the same views. They were, all, all this stuff. You can look, look it up. But it was a, it was a pretty significant uh, bogey. And it's been forgotten. It's in the memory hole. Nobody wants to talk about it. But this is real data. Okay? So we are seeing, since, you know, almost over 20 years... The earth has been cooling. It's not been warming. That's, that's reality. And uh, that's going to have, man, it's going to manifest itself in, if it continues at least, in, you know, possibly affecting crop yields. You know, we have more people every year, but we have less arable land to grow food on. Why? Well, as people, population grows, you can see that around any city as the suburbs keep encroaching into farmland. Uh, Farmers are getting older. They sell out. There goes another subdivision. Uh, This is the same trend around the world. As people urbanize, they build out and they start, you know, building on farmland. And, you know, as we see the climate change, which it will, uh, in my view, not the way most people think, 
uh, we will see some areas become more areable and some become less areable. That's just uh, what, what we can expect to see. So, you know, we've experienced excellent growing seasons around the world due to warm temperatures. Population continues to increase and arable land per person continues to decline. What happens if we have crop failures instead of bumper crops? You know, we've already seen, you know, I, I talked about the corn crop not getting in. What's going to be the effect? What's the effect of all the flooding we've had along the Mississippi that knocked out all that storage? You know, when you see pictures of those storage bins that are inundated with water, that grain has to be destroyed. You can't use it. It becomes moldy and it's unusable. You know, there's no discussion about that because the people on the coast that control the media, they don't give a shit what happens in Nebraska. They're not even going to go bother going out there. But you can find it all over the internet. So, you know, this narrative, this uh, story, this spinning of a yarn about global warming and it's you and you need to feel bad and you need to, uh, do, you know, we need to uh, flail ourselves over the fact that we're destroying the earth is not true. And that's the narrative and it's not it's too many people with vested interest for that to change. So what I'm telling you is, is that you're not, you're going to have to see this through experience. You're going to have to look at it yourself. You're going to have to see what the data is really showing because they're not going to come on MSNBC or CNN or even Fox and tell you, you know what, we were wrong for the last 25 years and there's a good possibility that the earth's going to cool and that's going to be a real bummer for most people. That's not going to happen. You know, it's very difficult to get a person to change their view when uh, their livelihood depends on them not changing their view. Take that into consideration. So I'm, I'm just telling you what my observations have been for the last 15 or 20 years through this whole thing. When I was in university, I got in huge arguments with environmental science people about this. It was right around that East Anglia thing. And what I was told was there are certain people, they were pointing at people like me, that have a vested interest in the fossil fuel industry and they don't want to. I don't really care one way or another, okay? If you want to put windmills up, nuclear power, coal power, it doesn't really affect me. I can get a job, okay? I care about the truth. And I just, when I saw the kind of people and what was motivating them, I didn't get a sense that, you know, they were really concerned about the earth. When you're, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio, you know, uh, lecturing me, I mean, this guy is lecturing the normal people about their carbon footprint and the people are jet, jet setting all over hell's creation. I don't take it seriously. That's called hypocrisy. That person has no, uh, you know, if they were living in a mud hut and living off the land and, you know, composting their own crap and stuff like that, then I'll listen to somebody like that. But no one wants to live like that either. You know, we've seen that in election after election, just recently in Australia. The the Labor Party, which was, you know, had this same type of mentality, was basically trounced last week by, by the Liberal Party, which, uh, which, you know, ran on a thing of, hey, they're destroying the economy with, with this stuff and your, your power price is going to go up. I mean, you're seeing that trend around. The same thing happened here in the U.S. You know, we pulled out of the Paris climate change thing. Trump pulled us out. Did the world end? No. Did the temperature go up? No. I mean, this is it's just ridiculous. So I, I put a few things in here. These are just anecdotal. Like I said, I have no proof right now. Um, it's all anecdotal. I'm not a climate scientist. I do read the papers. I listen to lectures. I don't look for confirmation bias. But, you know... One, one other anecdote, I was actually talking to an engineer that I was work, working on a project with, and he was going on and on. I go, what are you going on about the CO2? I said, don't you understand that CO2 is a life-giving gas? He said, no, it's a pollutant. So they have now are teaching in university science that CO2 is a pollutant. CO2 is a life-giving gas. Plants use it for the photosynthesis, that animals consume the plants. I mean, it's the life cycle. You can look it up on the internet. There's been study after study where people have introduced CO2 into greenhouses to get higher yields on plants. The earth is actually greening because CO2 is higher than it's been in a long time. We don't look at the net benefits. We just have all these charlatans coming out telling us the world's going to end. And like I said, I don't take advice from, you know, bartenders and, you know, autistic teenagers from Sweden. That, I, I, that's not going to happen. So when you look at who they're putting out there as the spokespeople and the people that are, we're supposed to listen to, you know, they, they said about this girl in Sweden, her parents told the media, she can see CO2 molecules. I mean, 
I, I can't take this seriously. So like I said, don't email me. Don't give me your... I'm not going to argue with you. I don't care what you think. This is my channel. This is an editorial. Okay, enough said on that. Let's talk about offshore oil. So we saw a complete cl collapse recently in the offshore oil uh, industry stocks. Um, some of them being down, I mean, 50% in the last 30 days. It's like, okay, is the offshore oil industry going bankrupt? Is that the message being sent? I think what's interesting to take a look at is, is that the bonds for a lot of these companies did not move down. So we, what we have is we have short-term news and expectations not being met. So sediment has gotten completely horrible. I mean, this is a chart of ENSCO. You can see this thing. This thing's like falling like uh, straight down. It's basically, it's basically down about 60 something, you know, 70% in the last, you know, six months since, you know, Q4 when we had the big, uh, the big down dip in Q4 of 2018 when oil crashed. And what this chart is telling you is that ENSCO is going out of business. I don't really see that. I mean, if you take ENSCO Rowan's cash position, if you take uh, the value of the rigs it holds, you can liquidate the whole company right now, pay off the debt and, and make money. That's how cheap this thing is now. And the facts of the actual business are not backing up the share price. So what we're seeing here is just a complete lack of any sediment, uh, negative sediment, and people just do not care about this. You know, now we have, well, the world's going to end again because China and the U.S. with this trade thing and blah, 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 we're going to have a crash. And okay, the world's still using 100 million barrels a day of oil. 100 million barrels of oil a day. 36 billion barrels of oil a year. This is a extractive industry. If you pull 36 billion barrels out of the ground in a year, you have to find and be ready to produce an additional 36 billion barrels the following year. At some point, if you don't replace the barrels, you no longer have any oil to extract. What does offshore oil service do? It enables the oil companies to go out and find and extract offshore oil. Offshore oil contributes 30% of the world's oil. So to sit here and say it's going extinct or it's going away is not true. There's a lot of negative sentiment towards oil and, and, and offshore oil. I get it. It's been in the doldrums for a long time. Nobody cares about it. It's, it's probably even worse than uranium now. But I don't see it going away. Here's a chart of Transocean, the big daddy. You can see it's crashed too. It crashed in the fourth quarter. It tried to rally and then it's crashed again. Maybe we'll see a double bottom get put in here in the next few weeks. I don't know. I don't really care. I mean, what I look at and I deep dive this thing and go to the second and third level is I'm, I'm, I'm watching what's happening in the industry. I'm watching what people are saying. I'm watching what's actually the reality of the business. And the reality of the business is, is that, you know, I, I, there's a website called Basso Offshore. I believe it's in Norway. And you can, I'll put a link to it. You can go there and they have an analytics page and they track all of the rig rates, uh, the new uh, contracts that are being let. And we're constantly seeing utilization rates in various classes of rigs are improving. That means more rigs are going back to work. You know, when we, read a, when we reach a certain utilization rate, say around 80%, then we'll see day rates start falling. So, you know, in the last week or two, what really beat sediment down was a couple of companies, or one of the companies actually signed a contract with an oil company at what was perceived by the market to be a very low day rate. And that just sent reverberations through an already bombed out market. And people just said, that's enough. I've had enough. They're just puking these stocks up left and right. I know Greenlight Capital sold all of their, and I think, just puked up the majority of their position in ENSCO. And I've s heard other anecdotal evidence like that. But the bottom line is, if you listen to what's happening in the industry, if you listen to the insiders, if you see and observe the facts, the businesses are actually improving and not marginally significantly. So, there's a recent article, I'll put a link to it, by uh, Basso Offshore, and the title was, 
uh, and it goes into why this is true. It says, recent long-term offshore drilling contract awards might not fit with investors' expectation, but it's the expectations that are the problem, not the reality. And the bottom line is this is going to be a longer, more drawn-out uh, recovery than we've seen in the past. It's not going to be the V-shaped recovery. It's going to be more of a slow grind to the upper right on the chart. And the reason why that is is for several reasons in my view. Number one, um, we do know that international oil companies, the big integrators that mostly do these projects offshore, I'm talking about your Shells, your Totals, ExxonMobil, BP, these kind of companies that, that can spend, you know, $50, $100 million on a well. You know, they've been under a lot of pressure from shareholders to recycle a lot of that cash, the record cash flows that they're seeing into dividends and stock buybacks. They're also migrating out to shale. You've seen ExxonMobil and, uh, beyond, and Occidental when they were bidding for Anadarko for those big Permian assets. Because why? Because those are short cycle quick turnaround type deals. You know, you can put a lot of money into shale and recycle your cash back in two to four years on these projects, where it would take eight to 10 years with an offshore project. But you still have other companies like Total, they're focused offshore, they're, they're, they're tendering more work. And even Exxon and these other ones, they, they can't walk away from 30% of the oil supply, which is the offshore oil market. So you know, we've seen the decimation in the offshore market. We've seen the mergers. We've seen the bankruptcies. And now we're seeing the recovery. It's just going a lot slower than people thought, but it is here. You know, um, it's just simply not going to go away. And for people that think it is, then they need to tell me where you're going to get that 30 million barrels a day. You know, I go back to what I've said before. This is an extractive industry. It's 100 million barrels a, a day. I mean, let, let's look at a company like Ensco, for example. They have a huge amount of debt. It doesn't begin to be, to be due significant amounts of it until 2024. If this thing hasn't turned around by 2024, then, you know, the, the, the company will go bankrupt. But I just don't see that happening because in that four years, the, you know, the, the world economy is going to consume close to 145 to 150 million, billion 150 billion barrels of oil, okay? That is a lot of oil, and you have to recycle cash. You have to go out and find oil to replace that produced oil. You know, I showed in a previous video that the reserve life indexes, meaning the oil that the international oil companies have, has been going down for the last four years, which makes sense because they haven't been reinvesting in to look for new production. And... You know, we are, we are going to see this inflection point. We've already seen it, and they're going to start recycling cash. So um, there was a uh, conference uh, in Houston last week, and uh, it was a Marine Money Conference. I'll put a link to it. There were several interviews. I suggest you listen to them. And, you know, we've seen, you know, here, here's, some, here's what, we've, what we've heard. Um, the ENSCO CFO, you can listen to the lecture. I'll, I'll put a link to it. The recovery is underway. Then he goes on to say it's a volatile industry and people have been burnt. New capital coming in, is not coming in because people are not seeing the cash flow yet. Okay. Um, we had the, a guy from uh, the CEO of Vantage drilling. He said major oil companies have record cash flow. We know this. They have massive firepower for new projects. And they're seeing more and more tenders, these drilling companies. You know, I've got uh, some more uh, anecdotal evidence here. You know, here's Pacific Drilling CEO. While the market remains challenging, we are encouraged by the upturn in utilization within the sector and continued improvement in demand as indicated by tender activity and direct discussions with clients. Uh, Marisk Drilling stated that fixture activity continues to increase for both jackups and floaters. Tendering activity continues to increase for jackups while floater tendering activity seems to be more muted. So this is what you normally see. You see the jackups normally rise first because it's shallower water, cheaper to drill. And then as the cash flows continue to be maintained and people get, get their sea legs and feel better about what's happening, they'll make more and more commitments to go deeper and deeper. And that will start to get you into the raising utilization rates for the uh, floaters and the uh, drill ships. So that's my expectation. And it's going to take longer. And, you know, I can't tell you what to do. I mean, I'm going to buy some more of some of these stocks that I, that I have uh, confidence in. 
I think they're going to have tremendous returns over the next three to five years. This is not a three-week trade. This is not a three-month trade. This is going to take, you know, 18 months to two years to three years. And the bottom line is these reserves have to be replaced. Shale oil, a few, you know, you know, a couple, few, four or five counties in West Texas cannot make up for the rest of the world. It simply is not going to happen. So we will see increased shale, but, you know, that's another problem. Crude quality matters. You're getting a very light, sweet crude out of the Permian, and a lot of the refineries in the West, on the um, Co Gulf Coast are, are dialed up for heavier sour crude. So there's all these little things that are going on in the market. Just looking and saying, well, you know, the United States is net energy independent. I mean, not looking at crude quality, not looking at infrastructure, not looking at, you know, the fact that these these shale companies have $350 billion in debt. The fact that they can't even make them any money, much less cash flow positive. Nobody looks at any of these things. That's first level thinking. You got to look beyond that. So this industry is not going away. Um, it's consolidated and it, the business is getting better. You know, this is, this is the dynamic of how you, you make the big money. And I want to remind people, talk, you know, what would Walter Schloss say about this? Walter Schloss being a Ben Graham student, he, then he went off on his own like Warren Buffett. Not a lot of people know about Walter Schloss because he, he, did, he didn't seek out fame and, 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 and for, he didn't want to be, you know, in the spotlight. But uh, there was an article that uh, he was uh, interviewed in Forbes magazine in 1973, and I want to throw out a couple of uh, the quotes in there, and I'll put a link to this also, and also to a page that has a lot of good Walter Schloss um, information. I suggest people read it because he was a tremendous value investor, and he uh, had a very unique way of looking at things. He really didn't care about earnings. He mostly cared about book value and assets. And he had the same mentality that I have. He, that's why I like this guy. He, he, he wanted to buy bombed out companies that he thought at some point could turn around. Let me, let me read some of these quotes. He says, at such a time, these companies and industries get into disrepute and nobody wants them, partly because they need a lot of capital investment and partly because they don't make much money. Since the market is aimed for earnings, who wants a company that doesn't earn much? So, Schloss went on, if you buy companies that are depressed because people don't like them for various reasons and things turn a little in your favor, you get a good deal of leverage. He goes on in the article and he says, uh, the thing about buying depressed stocks is that you really have three, things, three strings to your bow. Earnings will improve and the stocks will go up. Someone will come in and buy control of the company or the company will start buying its own stock and ask for tenders. So, you know, what we're seeing in uranium and these offshore stocks and some of the shipping stocks, I mean, you could actually sell the steel, you could sell the drill rigs for these companies, pay off the debt and walk away with money. At some point, somebody will do that if it doesn't improve. Like I said, these businesses are not going to dry up and blow away. It's the same thing with uranium, okay? No one's building new uranium mines, but yet, you know, you're consuming uranium as we speak. In, in the reactors and you're building new reactors at some point this is a problem and with these type of industries you can't just flip a switch make an app uh, you know snap your fingers or throw a switch or pull a, pull a lever and everything changes in a day or two these are long lead time industries they take a lot of planning take a lot of work and people don't don't like to make investments when uh, things look bad and that creates a, the it creates the um, shall we say the setup for the next up cycle I don't know when it's gonna happen and it's not it's not fun for me to sit here and tell you that yeah just keep buying offshore oil stocks people some people can't take it they're gonna sell I saw several people on Twitter that are money managers they've sold out that's it they're done I don't have to I know what's gonna happen I know that that, that these companies are going, their businesses are improving. I can sit here and wait, and I will double down because that's the confidence and, and conviction that I have. Uh, not everybody's built that way. Uh, some people, it, it, their, their, it, their gut, you know, they get sick to their stomach, they get headaches, they get nervous. You know, especially money managers that have to report to uh, an investment uh, board or, 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 or an investment chief investment officer. I don't have to do that. But I understand, uh, you know, and... I've been talking like this for a year, year and a half on these videos, and these things really haven't improved. They've gotten worse in uranium and offshore. 
So people would be well within their, uh, you know, views to say this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. But if you look at the fundamentals, if you look at what's really happening, show me the bear case. Show me, you know, uh, where where we're wrong. And I, I just don't see it. And uh, these things have uh, an offshore. It goes in cycles. It's cyclical. I can't call the exact day. But, you know, th as I've demonstrated, you can do your own research. The businesses are improving. People are spending more money. These big companies are spending more money on offshore, and it's going to trickle through. It's just going to take a lot longer than people thought. So that's it for this week. Went a little bit long. Um, I appreciate people keep signing up. People keep uh, listening. Um, getting to the point now where I'm looking at some... Um, software so we can start hopefully conducting some interviews with some interesting folks out there so i'll be looking forward to that over the next month or two as i get that set up so i really appreciate the support guys uh, you guys have been terrific and uh i thank thank you a lot for uh listening to my uh, uh videos so we'll talk to you next week thanks <music>